That's a great thing. Now, you talked about the idea of beginning to develop the baseline for this kind of therapy uh, using the, I guess, second line therapy in terms of a hormonal uh, a Lupron based product that would give you an idea of how the patient can potentially react to the ongoing therapies. How do you see that being ultimately used in, in clinical practice? Well, in, in the specific um, uh, example that you mentioned, what we're doing is using the patient's initial response. Uh, this, is, this would be for patients with prostate cancer. We would look at their initial response to the chemical castration, usually Lupin, but there's other drugs. And we watch how they respond. And that's fed uh, continuously into the computer model, which then develops a, uh, a, a a, a computational uh, assessment of the different subpopulations within the tumor. What what are the populations that are present at the beginning? Uh, how are they affected with the initial therapy? And then as the tumor begins to recur, what are the uh, combinations of, of, uh, of, of uh, subpopulations that are present giving rise to that increase? And by doing that, you can then predict going forward what you think would be the best therapy next. We can, it, and it's more than just predicting the best drug. It's also predicting the best dose. Uh, in, in other words, we, we always right now treat with the maximum possible dose, the idea being to kill as many tumor cells as we can. But we know that that, re, that typically results in the release of the resistant uh, cells. It actually maximally um, selects for them and it eliminates their their competitors so that they actually have a, uh, a completely open field to proliferate. So our goal with this is to not only have the computer give us what the best drug is, but also um, what are the subpopulations that are, exist. And given that, what do we think are the best is the best dosing schedule for that drug that would allow the longest progression-free survival? So what we want to do. It's not only get a response, but we also want to maximally delay the growth of the resistant cells to that therapy. When you look at response, are you looking at PSA levels, uh, PSA velocity? What are the, the, the metrics that you're using to chart response? Yes, yeah, so we're using um, both of those things. We're looking at PSA decline, the rate of decline, the rate of increase. We're looking at the nadir value compared to the um, to, to the uh, baseline value, um, and so those are those are pieces of information that we that we have, and we can time those against the onset of therapy, um, and we can also then also we can also look at the length of time at which a patient is at a nadir, and basically we can then go backwards and say, well, what are the populations that were present at the beginning that give rise to this set of results, and um, and then well, what would be the reason, what, what are the populations that are present at the next time when you have to start another therapy? Um, and, and, and so with those, with that in mind, what would our computer predict would be the best therapy uh, and what would be the outcome if we just give standard therapy? And it goes without saying that this is highly individualized, so every patient has their own trajectory. Now, one of the things we talked about, you know, and again, you know, Bob, you, you really looked at this in, in many cases, is the whole thing of imaging and that maybe we need to do a better job even before we start thinking about treatment failures, but really in identifying the tumor itself in terms of being able to have an optimized approach before we put a knife to someone or stick them under a uh, radiation, you know, uh, therapy. Why don't you talk a little bit about this whole idea of imaging and how you see that being used progressively as the disease moves forward? So, uh, you know, every cancer patient, even before they uh, get a biopsy or get a knife, they get an image. Um, the, and it's my strong belief that we don't do enough with these images. Images contain uh, a wealth of information that's not exploited. So we and our colleagues have been uh, working over the years to convert imaging and images to mineable data 
in order to pull out either prognostic factors or information about the subregions within tumors. We know that tumors are highly heterogeneous and that they, they can exist in regions. They can have distinct habitats within them. And these habitats are accessible by, by modern standard of care imaging techniques. And often these images are uh, obtained in uh, prostate cancer patients either with a body coil or an endorectal coil. Obviously the endorectal coil gives a much higher resolution. Uh, but these are obtained routinely. And uh, we don't do enough about extracting all of the important information. Furthermore, the, uh, the identification of habitats can also direct biopsies. Uh, if, you, if you do a biopsy in a patient, and not knowing uh, where the biopsy is coming from, then uh, you may get some molecular information about one part of the tumor, but uh, you, you can't base the therapy uh, on, uh, against the whole tumor on, on one uninformed uh, biopsy. It has to be, it has to be uh, image guided, and um, quite frankly, you know, the, the idea of taking multiple biopsies from a prostate cancer patient is not unusual. Uh, and uh, this could be done in a, uh, in a much more informed way with, with uh, interaction with imaging.